Welcome to January 21st EDIC meeting. This meeting is scheduled to go till 5.30. Heads up. Um, so, it's been a while since we saw each other. Thanks for being here. December got canceled because terrible weather. Um, but a bunch of us showed up to a fun thing announcing that uh, the Route 10 uh, restructuring of the roadway. Hey, Casey. And um, making the way for the future of the East Hampton iteration of the Valley Co-op could go ahead. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. Pretty dicey driving to it. Pretty slushy driving home from it. Good times were had. Um, so, has everyone had a chance to review the November 19th, 2019 meeting minutes? Yes, yes, I have. That is the right answer. You agree. <laughs> um, I have five points of contention. Five? No, That's a lot. Motion to approve. Okay, thank Second. you so much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All in favor of approving the November 19th meeting minutes, holler aye. Aye. Any nays? Any abstentions? Great, they are so approved. Um, now we technically have public speak time. We have a member of the public here. Chris Lee, you have anything you want to share? I don't. All right. I just came to listen. I want to hear what's going on with ADUs. Cool, man. Is there anyone who doesn't know who Chris Lee is? Paul, Chris. Okay. Chris, good to meet you. Paul, thank you. David. Hey. Hey. Good to meet you. Um, Chris is the president, the Whatever. leader of Bill's the Backyard ADUs, so <laughs> he has been working on the project with uh, Sarah Hunter and Chandra Linnell on Mayor Street. Uh, okay, you're up, Jeff. Planning Department, Thank what's up? Um, it says internship, so... Um, it's just a list of possibilities. <laughs> it says including, because yeah. it was on the back of my mind. And it's at the front of my mind because uh, the planning department is working with Westfield State formally, finally, to establish kind of an internship opportunity program. And um, we have selected an intern. Uh, her name is Tess Dun Dunleavy. And coincidentally, this morning was her first day. Great. Um, and amongst other sort of ancillary projects, the two main projects that we're trying to formulate for her is to start the process of um, updating the economic development section of the master plan. Um, so last time, last completed in 2008. Um, the internship program will run until May, um, uh, at which time she graduates from Westwood State with a master's in regional planning. Unless there's some opportunity to keep her kind of in a short term, kind of not necessarily like a position in the planning department, but there's an opportunity, there's a potential opportunity for a job through the summer, in which case we could elongate the process. But the goal that uh, Gwen and I met, I think twice to kind of formulate some of the, the goals, uh, ideally uh, the intern can come at the next meeting and just give an, a brief overview of any data collected and, and kind of the process that we're gonna set forth for her. Um, I think that we, don't have the expectation that she will be able to update that chapter of the master plan in one in one shot. But if we could utilize three interns over a period of the year, then we might be very close um, to gathering a lot of data and fleshing out you know preliminary goals and things like that that would come through this committee. Um, so of her two primary projects, this is one of them to kind of work on that and work with the EDIC and give updates. Um, the other project is to um, also gather some data and begin to formulate uh, our process to update our open space and recreation plan. So that is a document that we have for open space and recreation that's actually set to expire in October. So I'm working on that with some internship help. Um, we're going to apply for some funding through the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to do the rest um, and to have that. Those are her two main projects. So, um, we did select a consultant for the housing study. So it's a comprehensive housing needs assessment, uh, housing production plan update, and then we threw in a whole bunch of stuff. So um, I think this group has talked, seen the RFP. Um, I'll pass around quickly like the proposal 
we're signing contracts probably this week, in which case we will then probably chart out like a kickoff meeting. Mm -hmm. That would be um, members of this group, whoever is, is interested, we can, we can formulate it so this group would be invited alongside the housing partnership. So those are the, you know, the two committees that are really going to be participating in that process. So I would expect by your next meeting in February, we'll have hopefully had a kickoff, some kind of introductory meeting with the consultant in, in this group and the partnership. Great. A couple. I have a couple questions. Yes. Was it August? Was the was the anticipated report date or, or sooner maybe? Um, I, the, there's two, there are multiple deliverables okay. outlined there. Um, we do have a housing production plan that's set to expire in August. So that's our affordable, affordable housing plan. So that will, that should get front loaded. Okay. I don't know whether the consultant will have everything done by August, but at least that piece will be done to meet the guidelines by DHCD. So um, that was kind of outlined. We, I haven't met with the consultant yet to like really flesh out the exact timeline. But that's okay. Piece. Did you have an Yeah, um, you might have said that at the beginning. I might have missed it. But how many hours was the intern scheduled to be working? Um, generally, it's going to be ten hours per week. Okay. Uh, through mid May. Sorry. Cool. Sort of agreed upon outline. On, on the housing project, Jeff. Yep. That's that's looking at all 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 issues related to housing, like stock, like demand, like not well, just it doesn't just, just this looks like it tells you what the what yeah. the information there is. Yeah, I apologize. Is. I wish I had thought in more important thing in that. Housing needs, okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a little out. bit like their resume and what they'll produce for us. Yeah, looks you have like. that digitally? Yes. We'll just share it. Yeah. Is that like the, the broken into tasks, which is what you were talking about? Yeah. Yep, so you can improve that. Yeah, it's comprehensive. So Originally, it was just going to be housing production, which is affordable housing, and then we added on um, through the state grant. We added on a whole bunch of other things, including um, you know looking at acceler accessory dwelling units by right Whole section here in ADU. Yep. yep, and that was part of the plan all along, which I think is good. It's complementary to everything you're doing. We are looking at asking them to do a couple site evaluations for larger vacant properties, mm -hmm. and just explore what kind of housing development could happen there. Um, so, so to follow up on what Casey said without me trying to read it, because I, I listen better than I read, <laughs> what's the deliverable at the end of the um, that they produce for us? There, are, there are multiple. So um, there'll be, yeah, I would need to pr actually prove it myself. All right. Give you okay. like a fully articulated. So we have a housing needs assessment. Um, which is the data. So the thing that we saw was that you needed the same data to do a housing needs assessment and to do the housing production plan. So we're, we're, we're being efficient by having the consultant do the data analysis okay. once, and then they can use it for a couple different Life. purposes. Yeah. Um, so they should have that. We asked for them to look at the zoning for um, barriers to housing development, so it's a, it's a so the, they can look at the zoning and figure out with, with input. Like, this is a consistent blockage to housing. Um, we've talked in this group about like small lots, so the you have to have a hundred feet of frontage, you know, and in some areas that's just not working. If that were adjusted, that could be removed as a barrier. Um, the site assessments is a deliverable. Um, draft language, whether or not it's necessary for ADUs, w was a deliverable, and then because that was expected to happen, we asked about like a guide, a homeowner's guide, to, to, to take the next step, how to get funding for those kind of things. So, I just think it's interesting, and I'm sure there'll be hurdles all the way to get get over, but um, w with a, with an end deliverable. But you know, for example, all all the talk about taxes right now. And then there was a piece about, and I think it's listed, Dave, the Fedor property. And I, th and I think they've exaggerated the number of building units that could go in. But the point is a lot could go there. Um, this would be on South Main Street going out of town, the big open field. 
and nothing like housing stock to level off prices, to level off the help with taxes, what have you. But there was an uproar about we have to save this land, it can't be developed. Okay, if you want to save this one, which one do you want to develop? Because we can't save them all and we can't develop them all. So Why not? Why can't you have your cake and eat it twice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, there's nothing like, we've said it all along, it's, it's supply and demand. And right now there's too much demand and not enough supply, and that's what's driving up prices. And it's not, not you know, I, I can complain all I want about my reassessment, but you know what? It's where the price should be based on today's sales. Mm -hmm. So the fact that my, an assessment on one of my properties went up by $50,000, sure, my wife can blow a cork when she's got to write a check for the taxes, but that's what I would sell it for if I was going to sell it. Right. So probably a little bit more. more. Probably more. Yeah. Probably more. Yeah. So, um, but w what in the economic cycle of housing life, what can correct a lot of that is more stock. Yeah, and they also are going to look at incomes, you know, the median income and, and the, afford the, the relative affordability of housing compared to people's income. So that's that's a kind of a standard data set that we don't currently have. At least it's not up to date. So, so it, you know, the way we've positioned it is it's it's a data driven study that will have a series of deliverables, and then there was one more which is kind of an outline of a master plan. So, so with all the data and all these things that we're looking at, can, can we articulate a couple goals that are supported generally by the community for housing, which we also don't really have that either. So, and, and did you say you were going to be able to get them that data from that uh, Council on Aging yes. study? Yeah. Because that was important, yep. factual data about aging and population sizes and Yes, they will have that. That's Perfect. that would be definitely provided to them. Um, so that's a bi that's a big deal. Um, we um, with with some help of uh, members of this group, we submitted uh, last Friday a, a smaller grant. So it's it would be a, a grant for fifteen thousand dollars to help um, begin the process of exploring wayfinding. Um, and, and kind of placemaking for, we have, really we have four distinct areas of our downtown. So Pleasant Street, Mills area, Main Street, Union Street, and Cottage Street. And so the idea is that if you do not live here and you travel into town, um, proper locations for signs to get you to the right place are not there. And then once, so you're, once you're in a place, there's not really, you're not really indicated as to where you are. So this is the, the baseline kind of study that most communities do. So the study is to tell us where to put signs? It's a little bit of everything. Is there funds for sign edge? No. no. No, okay. no because they're only for the consultant. It's the most disappointing part of it. Gotcha. <clears throat> it is, but it's, you know, the state has a incremental process. Yeah. So they don't give you funding for random signs if you haven't taken the initial step to kind of go through this, this type of process. So um, we really want to conceptualize kind of the four existing areas, um, develop and, ex and this was a key part, to develop and expand um, on the ECA's work. So East Hampton Cultural, East Hampton City Arts, sorry, um, created this, this map that began kind of like to articulate that we have these four distinct areas so we want to build on that um that's the basis one of those by the pond now right yeah correct yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the only that's sign that's that's yep um and then create a plan that comes up with some kind of sign scheme um locations and what we articulated was that there's there's two key target audiences which is people arriving by cars and then people that are either walking or on bikes. And so, so as I've done so far, as I've kind of asked a lot from the consultants, but um, we don't want to just get a car-oriented set of signs because we have the the rail trail. In my opinion, is really like an anchor. And if we can look at the rail trail and as a place where people are and how do they get to other places, that was really important. Yeah. Um, and then, to your point, Casey, is um, kind of provide a cost analysis and then they, they start to articulate so how much would it cost to do X Y and Z gotcha, and then we pursue the funding later for that so um, that's it and then the last thing 
is this is the first draft of the downtown strategic plan. So I've gone through as a red line. Um, there were some base, very basic things that just needed to be corrected. Um, nothing out of the ordinary. And my hope is that we get sort of the draft for review um, as early as next week. Mm -hmm. so, so this committee can get it. Uh, we have the sounding board who pulled in um, some other business owners um, and property owners, so they'll get it, <coughs> the mayor will get it, and then we'll go into this review process with this. So um, it looks incredibly daunting, but when you break it into sections, half of this, a lot of pictures. Half of this is uh, the public outreach stuff, mm -hmm. and then there's really good synthesis of existing conditions. Um, there's the school reuse section, and then there's um, sort of you know, if, if any of you went to the exercises, the, the meetings, there's kind of downtown specific proposals. So um, that I, I was planning on transmitting as soon as I got it kind of a second version. Do you have a specific request of this group if people take on reading it? Um, I will articulate that in once I have it. And, yeah, we'll, we'll figure that out. So that's my update. While you're here, Jeff, could we touch for a moment on the Union Street? Um, Redevelopment, for lack of a better word. Yep, the reconstruction. Yeah. Reconstruction. Um, there was a meeting last week, week before, I forget which. Um, huge, huge attendance. It was great. I mean, standing room only. Um, I think overall it's pretty positive. Mm -hmm. um, I know there'll be a lot of um, people. People seem to get in the weeds in a hurry at these kinds of meetings about little things. But um, overall, I think it's it's really positive. It'll be nice when it's done. A couple of surprises that hit me maybe later after was, um, and, and looking around the room at some faces, yeah. uh, it looked like they were surprised too, but one of them was the, the loss of um, 30 parking spaces on Union Street. So there's there's 65 parking places today, and whoever that, I don't remember the gentleman's name who was making the main presentation, but he was he's good and he knows his stuff. He's really good. Right. Um, but he made the comment that of the 65 parking places we have today on Union Street, um, Ten of them are currently illegal, based, based on today's code. Yeah. Either too close to a crosswalk, right. too close to an intersection, what have you. Oh, yeah. um, so you could argue we're only losing twenty, right. um, but it's you know it's probably required because of the narrowness of the street and what have you. Um, but the other surprise that hit me was the number of easements that was required. It's going to be like thirty-seven yeah. easements are required, which means taking a property to make it work and I think what caught the mayor off guard is you know you take the property get an appraisal the, 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 the this these guys are going to come back with a, with the 37 and say here's the appraised value the city's got to come up with that money to pay those folks right the values won't be as high as you people think though they won't be but what scared me Dave was times 37. I mean, even if they were $1,000 a piece, it's $37,000. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't even know where the property, you know, I'm guessing I'm guessing where some of it is and, and other parts of it might be pretty, pretty small, what they're going to take. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think the, the mass DOT person's response to that was, we are where we should be. And, and the, so the mayor got up and said, well, what, what are the easements? And they said, well, actually, we're at 25%. Usually the easements don't become clear. The, the full scope of the easements don't become clear until the 75% stage. So we are where we should be with that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the We started to look at it quickly, but there hasn't been much time since that meeting. Um, I think generally speaking, many of them are going to be very small. Mm -hmm. And I think it. I'm not, not in there, right? So. Right, and they're working within those street right of way, and then it's it's small encroachments beyond that to accommodate something. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is still a lot of opportunity to discuss with individual property owners. Here's here's the existing condition. Here's what we are proposing, and to try to have discussions about giving the land for that purpose rather than trying to purchase it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, those discussions haven't happened. Um, there are a few cases that I have not, I'm not, I didn't develop the plans, obviously. Um, the person who you were saying was well-spoken is the city's consultant. So, so. What were the initials of that? Uh, VHB. VHB. So they're a common kind of, um, sort of transportation consultant in, 
you know, I did a little bit of homework, and so there was an al there was a there was an appropriation back in 2017. So this this I mean this started in 2013 with a small grant, um, this MDI grant that we did for wayfinding, funded the first look at Union Street back in 2013. And then there was a long, kind of a long period where not much was happening, but then by 2017, um, DPW went to city council and got an appropriation. It was significant. It was 450,000 um, towards the design. And so since that point, we've been in this design phase and VHB is our paid consultant to do this. So they're still with us all the way through this. So they'll help um, study the Eastman issue and figure out how significant those are. And I think well, ultimately, who's paying for reconstruction? So it, the way I the way I understood it from that meeting was two funding sources. There's federal funding and state funding. It's like an 80-30 Well, the reason why I ask you, that, that's why you don't have to worry about the Eastmans. Because mm -hmm. when the state comes through there, they'll be, be, be small dollar figures. Some of them will be $200. Okay. No, I, and, I, and I don't know if the mayor was as worried about the dollars as she was the, the opportunity for outreach. They're going to spend more money. She's got the contact. They're going to hire one or two guys to work on this, two people, and they'll spend more money on their salary than they will probably on the easement. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think the reality is that that work really hasn't started yet. Yeah. So that 25% hearing had to happen right. um, to to continue the path with Mass DOT, and then they continue to go back and forth on the plans. Mm -hmm. I do think that the number may have seemed kind of staggering. If there was a number that was like 37, just guessing that you know a, a lot of them will be small and small like six inches yeah yeah it could be, it could be that and then and then you know there really is going to be a conversation with property owner really look at the potential benefit of this right can we negotiate you know the easement at no cost yeah and, and then, i mean yeah it's a good way to go. yeah my, i had experienced this twice but like route 66 in florence you know a couple guys want to hold out and you're like, fine, we'll hire a lawyer. But you know, yeah. what we're gonna, what you're gonna get paid is not gonna cover the lawyer. Yeah, pay me on, now. On, you know, because a lot of them were slivers, six inches up to 18 inches. They weren't significant, yeah. you know. And then the loss of parking is definitely important. But by and large, if you start at Riverside Industries and go up, um, that section is where the most parking is lost, right. and. It's not to say that there couldn't be a situation where someone lost parking and it's going to be a problem. We haven't gotten to that level of detail, but if you get up the street, um, uh, the diner, you know, there's a couple parking spaces in front of the diner that get lost, but the diner has standalone. Right. It's a fairly significant amount of parking. And then 7-Eleven, there are some really pretty terrible parking spaces right in front of 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven has its own parking. Right. And uh, on the other side of the street, the, the family dollar lot as configured has a substantial amount of parking. And so there's like three parking spaces in front that get removed. And that was to accommodate two lane bike, bike two back and forth bike lanes in that section up to the rail trail. Mm -hmm. And then the compromise was to just do a bike lane going in one direction. Um, and so the remaining loss of parking primarily is there's two spaces in front of the pack, um, Union Street package store, and then two in front of Pride. So those spaces get lost, and then the rest of them are pretty much remaining intact. Both those, those places have their own lots. Exactly. Yeah. So that was a lot of the rationale for yeah, that makes sense. those are keeping in the and, and, legal one. <laughs> so it, it's not to say that no one has an impact because of that, but there was a real concerted right. effort to look at that. The upper section is where you have like the historic building patterns where it's much more common for you to park, you go to get coffee, and you go to um, Rite Aid, you know? Mm -hmm. So so that was, in, there was really an intent to keep that. Yes. yes. I'm so sorry. So. It's okay. The, the um, yeah, I did understand it to say, like, from the bike path to the pond, there would be no parking. But you're right, everybody's got, everybody's got private parking. Yeah, there are a couple. So the parking, issues will be alleviated when the new school is built because a lot of the problem is pick up and drop off. Aside from those times, parking is not really a situation. I've never not been able to park. Have, have you guys? I mean, unless it's been pick up or drop off on Union Street. Uh, 
I just think it always ebbs and flows. Yeah, I mean, there's good times and bad um, times. There's times. I also, I think that I heard it in this committee, but does the city own some of the spots in the Family Dollar lot? I mean, it, it's That's not city I, property. It's that, all private, to my knowledge. So okay, private. I think so as well. I thought for some reason that we had one of the things that they talked about the future planning was conversation with shared lots yeah, with yeah. Yes. private owners to say, all right, can this be public use after five? Right. Some sort of insurance waivers or something to allow that to happen to try to figure out that you know, there's a lot of parking by the community feed, the East Hampton feed, and yep. you know to try to figure out. That sort yeah. of situation. So it's 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 educating the public about where. Yeah, and I think is. if you look at the parking here behind Fifty Payson, and you go you cast some distance up Cottage Street or cast some distance up Union Street, it's 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 technically you know within walking distance to the bike trail. So in a lot of ways, the spaces here could serve Lower Union Street, um, and that's that's something that we need to work on in terms of like the downtown strategic plan. We need to really like focus on that. And make sure people know that if they want to go to Lower Union Street for something, uh, which may not necessarily be the case right now, but it could be in the future, that the parking here is within you know 500 feet. Mm -hmm. so the one part that almost made me laugh out loud was he made a comment about widening the street if you could, but when you get to the Pizza House, uh, mm -hmm. the package store Pizza House, it's right there. There's no widening it. And what made me almost laugh was years ago, he, he I'm 94% sure his plans were to put the building back and the parking in the front and and planning forced him to reverse it because all the rage was having buildings right yep. to the sidewalk. And now you find out 25 years later, buildings next to the sidewalk aren't so great if you're looking at possible expansion of the street. The other piece real quick, and we'll get off of Union Street, was um, and I think he took a lot of notes on this and he's gonna look into it, but as we talk about infrastructure, water, sewer, yeah. there are no plans to replace the gas lines. But I turned to Joe Pip and I said, I'll pay you $1,000 if they don't dig that up within the first year it's done for a gas leak. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think, the, so I think underground like infrastructure should be looked at. I, the other corresponding comment was to, to questions about bearing the utility lines. And so that That's so. comes at a cost that will just <clears throat> greatly exceed, you know, the mass DOT will not fund that kind of stuff. And so if we're in this discussion about um, where would that money come from, you know, come from taxpayers. And so there's seemingly low tolerance to kind of take the, the above ground utility and bury them um, because it's not necessary. It's not required, but I think the gas line, while the road's ripped up, you know, that makes sense to at least assess. And I don't know how they do it, whether it's pieces or the whole thing, but yeah. They claim some of it's been replaced, but I don't recall. I guess right. some of it has been, but. I wasn't able to make the, um, that meeting, but uh, along with Casey said, we have a parking lot on, on Liberty Street that has 18 cars just down right. that um, certainly after hours, uh, we built it after we built our building on, so it's additional parking. We, we, we certainly would be open to open, I mean, on shared parking after okay. hours because it's not used at nighttime. I think that'd be really welcomed, and I think this, the downtown strategic plan, it kind of sets that up as goals. Um, if you do recall, like through that process, there should be discussion of the value of shared parking, and we asked for some agreement, like sample agreements, to yeah. figure out how that would work mechanically. Um, so that's a big, that's a big option. So I'm sure we'll take up on that. So on the shared parking, I did speak with an insurance guy um, <clears throat> that we all know, but there's no products for insuring parking lots for public use currently. So it might be something that the city has to self-insure. I don't, I don't know how that all works. Okay. But um, well, my attitude is simply that if if there's an agreement with the city, that yeah. I'm done right there. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it. That was city, my general you know, as well. Okay. I don't and, know and this, I don't know this may not have even protected us, but yeah. this was the Tom Brown School thinking for years. People always ask the bank about parking after hours, yeah. Sundays, if they had travel events, that could, could we meet, the bus meet here? And I said, absolutely not. You cannot use our parking lot. But yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So they were basically trespassing so that if somebody slipped on the ice, it doesn't mean they're not going to sue the bank, but you weren't parking there legally. Right. Or, I'm sorry, you weren't parking there with permission. We're yeah. invited, yeah. You, so, so maybe it's a don't ask, don't tell. If you have a wink and a nod that you can park there, 
Uh, don't know if that protects you in, in yeah. the case of a lawsuit, but I mean anybody can sue anybody today. But and you know, not for nothing, but it wouldn't be out of the realm of a smart idea to pay property owners to use their parking lots, even if it's some small token amount, because the amount of money a city will spend to develop parking spaces is not is tremendous compared to paying people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also flexible. Right. You can pull and add more. Um, I'm thinking the family dollar a lot. I'm sure they'd be happy to take, I don't know, X amount of money a month to just if they don't want to do it voluntarily. Yeah. Tom, what you're saying makes sense, and that's like the real world of how you do things, but it also does conflict with the earlier comment of we need to educate the public that they can park in these places. Right. Right. It, yeah, how my, do you do yeah, my statement was only if, if, if we can get, we would publicize it only if we can get the formal agreement in place. And my, my understanding, I'm not in insurance, obviously, I'm planning. <laughs> But the agreement, there's there's a mechanism within the agreement that removes liability to the property owner, and, and that agreement puts the city's coverage over that property for that period uh, of time. Uh, so if someone slips on the it's it's within the city, yeah. but and the city makes sure that it's well lit. Yes. And, and then I think, there's, yeah, there's, and I think Chris's point. I think that they, for especially for important lots, there there definitely should be a discussion about some um, revenue on behalf of the property owner. So like the city like, would. You know, I, I would argue that the city should try to pay something to make it appealing. Yeah, but even um, and, not, then, and then publicize. But even now, for years, <laughs> years, if there's an event going on at Flywheel or the Old Town Hall, you you almost can't park in the bank parking lot on a Friday night or Saturday night. But so what? We can't see it from our house. <laughs> <laughs> you just wait for the bank to open. On yeah. yeah. Camping out. Put meters in. <laughs> All right, lovely. Is there anything else that you'd oh, like to stuff. share? Good stuff. You have any needs from <laughs> us? Or any desires from us? No, the, I, I mean, I, I'm uh, sincere when I want to build the internship to have the intern report and work with EDIC for her time here. Mm -hmm. so, so that would be my ask for the next meeting to have her on the, on okay. the agenda. Cool. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Next up, Chris K. Eighty used by right. All right. So does everyone have the sting from last time? Yeah, or, I, I, I think I sent it. Yeah, yeah. I do right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how you guys want to do this. We went through something similar on the charter review. Yeah. Which, you know, different ways of doing things. But I mean, I would suggest we go through it line by line and then vote on agreeing it. That way. Okay. I mean, it's, I mean, most of these things are really. I don't anticipate a debate, but. Okay. Chris, that was the Cape Cod one. You're yep. talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind writing what we what, like as we go? Do you have a digital copy of this? Because then you could just cut and paste and edit it as we go. Yeah. I will sell the PDF in yep. December. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. It would maybe late, maybe even November. Yeah. Um, um, but. Yeah. I'm, Anyone have idea? Uh, is, it, is there a copy on? Can just make notes on here today? Um, I'll give you mine. Can I? Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me just make sure. Yeah. And then, yeah. Then when I get home, yeah. And, and I'm not on wireless like that. Yeah. I'll feel free to use this one because I can just follow along without looking at it. So we, we're all familiar with this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Because, um, yeah. I don't know the best way of doing it. So I guess I'll just read it. Um, you know, I would strike the Cape Cod Commission from the front and just do model zoning provisions for ADUs um, introduction. And then what I did was sh I struck everything up that had to do with the Cape Towns and started with the primary purpose of these zoning bylaws and ordinances is to permit the creation of a greater number and variety of housing units in terms of size and price, which can be integrated into the single family residential properties with little or no negative impact on the character. Um, and so this can get dry pretty quick, so just jump in if you have something that you want to add or dry? change. I'm wondering, <laughs> not to Chris, he's like sitting on the edge of his seat. This is the 105th one I've read. <laughs> I wonder if it's, and I don't want to cut it off at all, yeah. Chris, but I was wondering, I wonder if it's easier for you you to make the changes and resend it to everybody. And well, yes, I could do that. I've done it. I have it here. 
Are there some standout parts that you would like us to debate? Here All right, right let's let's do it that way. Yeah. What's yeah. the controversial? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, what's let's controversial to me and everyone else is different. So I'll just point out what's what's worth talking about. I think. Okay. Um, so we have a line here: town planners across the Cape. Um, I just want to uh, strike that and just say that having to go through planning discourages the creation of new ADUs. No one disagrees with that. Right. Not um, planning, but you know what I mean. So then we go down to the purpose and intent, and uh, you know it, the the draft says add moderately priced rental units to the housing stock. Um, I think just adding rental units to the housing stock is sufficient enough. Just, I mean, maybe somebody wants to make a very luxurious ADU. It's no problem with that, right? Mm, yeah. Or maybe they want to make a very Spartan. It's all about inventory. Right. Chris, just back, I'm sorry, back on that last one. Yeah. You said, I, I wonder if instead of going through planning, it should say instead of going through the special permit process. Um, I, 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 it doesn't say that, we're, we're, unless I'm you misunderstanding. Just, the one you just read before. Um, I struck town planners across the Cape report right. and just replaced it with this discourages the creation of new ADUs, only because we don't have many town planners here. You know, it was just a grammatical thing, because okay. okay. we're not towns across the Cape. We're just right. I thought I heard you say, rather than go through planning. Um, um, but it wouldn't necessarily be going through planning, it would be eliminating the special permit process. Right, and that's, yeah, that's, that's, um, <clears throat> that's, that's in the introduction. Okay. Um, so what else do I have? So another thing is to develop housing units on single family residential properties. But I don't see any reason why multifamily properties can't add another unit unless you guys do. No, my lot would be perfect for it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. So we can take out single family. Yep. Uh, yep, that's exactly what I did. Um, so you, we're on C now. Um, it says increase the number of small de dwelling units available for rent, but um, I don't see a reason for saying small. Or dwelling even, just units. Or or units. units. We do we're dwelling. I mean, we're not, well, you, housing units then, housing yeah. units. Yeah. Yeah, housing units. Dwelling good. sounds like squatting or something. <laughs> that sounds where people well, the dwelling is a definition. It's a building term as well. To live yeah, in, as I mean, opposed to. If you to don't have yeah. dwelling, it could be like yeah. a shed or something. Yeah. Or a casino right. or something. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. It's a defined term, dwelling unit. Yeah. Is accessory defined somewhere in the? Yeah. Room? I don't. No, that's fine. Um, I don't have that. Maybe I do. It's on definition. the second page. Oh yeah. Yeah. So just. So I, I, that's I think point. it's fine because you're in the purpose and intent, right? So, so that's got that's like a guidance, gives it a little bit of a guide for, for well, I guess lots of people who are going to look at this. So, city councilors who would work mm -hmm. on this plan, board members, and then the general public. So, I think it's fine. There is a there is a definition built in the accessory. So, there. Just to be understanding that there is some size limitation. I mean, I think the idea, the the idea generally for us to be focusing on is to make these um, so you could get a building permit. Mm -hmm. I, but the idea is that they are somehow accessory to the main house. So I think you know what will be a little bit problematic is we want to make sure we keep the accessory kind of connotation in there, at least in the definitions, because it will be. That's going to make it more in line with, with the general guidance where the state has been with the. So I think it's fine to take it out of the purpose and intent. No, I added it because it's going to stay in the definitions, which will give the, the specific where. Would we want to say? I'm uh, maybe asking this out of order, but right. um, would we want to say that the ADU can't be bigger than the primary residence? I think that's what Jeff's getting at, right? That's yeah. defined okay. somewhere. It's not Sorry. defined here. Um, I think it. I think it does say something about being subordinate in design. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. No, that's but, but as accessory, Jeff, it's just that accessory to it. So it becomes one property. You know, I understand it correctly. The accessory unit couldn't someday be sold Never. and it'll no. the other one. And that's that's covered so it becomes here. one it's definitely property. forbidden. It's part of the property. It, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Except that's the, another I, I would say it's a whole nother point of conversation. So there are there are ways to condoize these yeah. and sell them independently. Northampton allows it. Uh, Amherst doesn't disallow it. Um, lots of towns have not thought of it. 
um, but it does open up an enormous amount of financing to make more of these um, directly to the homeowner. And it does give renters the opportunity to stop renting and build these with their own finances in some mm -hmm. of the backyards. And um, basically create a condo association, a two-unit condo association. So I, I personally would argue against putting that specific language in there because there's a huge opportunity there to create $200,000, 800 square foot condos that allow the homeowners to make money, allow renters to get somewhere to live. Sure, I, I see that. Um, but the, the, the what I'm trying to achieve here is just basically saying Planning doesn't have to get involved anymore. Right. Easy right. Um, permitting too. I want to get Thanks that you. through, and then other incremental steps can be done. Um, because I think that once we get into that sort of thing, we're going to get bogged down in. The, we're going to risk the whole thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, no, I agree. Because under on section D, um, I was going to throw out, and, and I think it should go along with what you just said. Um, maybe two or three units per lot. I have ten acres. My house is forty-six hundred square feet. You know, I don't think I want to have a sea of um, tiny houses, but I could see maybe two being reasonable. Right. Maybe before, if it went before the ZBA or you know, or something, you know, another another level of scrutiny than by right. So by right, you could get one. Right. And then if you wanted a second one, you would go for the special permit or ZBA. Yeah. Right? yeah. I think that there. I think to. Okay. I mean, to Casey's point, man, there will be. There will be a point where it'll be. There's a point when it's easy, and then there's a point where it's going to be a little bit harder. And I think, you know, what we're trying to do is just break some of the patterns with zoning. Right. And I think we want to do that incrementally because I think that's going to be the best shot at making this happen. That the I think the most opportunities that will open up is with a single-family lot adding one unit. Right. And I think I, for the purposes of kind of thinking one year out. You know, I think we want to be doing incremental changes so that, and I think adding one additional unit to a single family house, I think there's huge arguments to say why that's so logical. Mm -hmm. I think adding onto multifamily houses is going to get a little bit more, multifamily property is going to get a little more complex because the zoning is historically much more complicated. Mm -hmm. And then the large, the large parcel with, and I, you know, there's been. I'm discussion. actually working with someone on that exact scenario now. Um, it's I don't even look at it as in the ADU realm. It's, right. it's a multifamily right. development, which I think, is they're really neat. I guess right. the only my only issue with not allowing it multifamily is you could have, um, you could have an owner occupied multifamily that has all the same needs for an ADU that a single family would have. It just happens to live on one side and rent the other side. And I've had multiple two-unit people uh, contact me in East Hampton who wanted to do this, and they have good yards for it. Um, I don't. I haven't seen any towns do it three or four units, but it, uh, two units is yeah. becoming more common. I should also mention that um, these ADUs don't necessarily have to be freestanding like you do. They can just be in-law apartments, right? So attached to the existing. Home. Yeah. If I mean, that's not always an option, you know, um, but. I, it should just be mentioned. Just from I think we are trying to embrace um, that single family homes and single family development has the least amount of restrictions on it. It's mm -hmm. the least amount of regulation. Yeah. It, it's, it's great. Constructing a single family house is the only time that you don't have to go to get a land use permit. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to we're trying to add to that the uh, the opportunity to add one more unit so i think so just historically just be mindful that i think single family home development is kind of where we're trying to position this and then going even to to duplex or tr the the triple plex you know <coughs> historically across the state you you enter into really common places for special permits so then you get it commercial property it's a higher hurdle a whole different whereas i think if we do single family house with one more unit I think for the purposes of looking at a year out, going to be a way straighter shot right. to, to getting. So yeah, what we just so put in there, we should take out. I just think the multifamily is just going to. So when you get to the planning board, the planning board is going to quickly identify. Well, in the zoning, multifamily is where you start to get special permit requirements, more regulation, and a much higher expectation. Like if you are in a butter, you would expect to get notified for multiple units going in next to you. 
Whereas the single family house, it's a building permit and no one's notified, but you know, house goes up, you know, without notice to abutters. That's an interesting point that you bring about the planning. Remember, what we're doing here, we're gonna hand off. Correct. And there's gonna be like a lot of other people going through this and picking out our language and saying that sucks, that's great. Um, so I think that our goal is just Start the ball rolling. Yeah. Yeah. Right. To start the snowball, get it into some, get it into the city council's hands. They split it with planning, as far as I understand. I don't I don't know the specific minutia of it, but planning does get a shot at it. Planning board. Yep. Board. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so it's going to go to city council, then it has to go to um, zoning and ordinance. I don't remember if that's one committee still. The ordinance ordinance is a subcommittee of the city council and it, go, it goes there next. Okay, and then it goes to the zoning. Yeah, and at some point, so it, it, with your with all this upfront work, you know, my my best guess would be that ordinance will will not hold on to it very long. Right. What they would do is then convene a joint public hearing with the planning board and ordinance ordinance for the planning board and the public to chime in on what's being proposed. Right. So <laughs> the more like we're done now, the, the quicker right. the process may be at the end. Right, so we should do our best, but let's not be it's scared of separate. making a mistake. We're not putting we don't it have to come up with the end game. Right, right. 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 We're, start we're, the right. But I think one more, just one more shot at yeah. trying it, because, so I think if you were going in the down the path of saying, well, let's, let's add a little bit more, maybe it'll get, you know, honed in, you might actually, um, reduce people's concerns if you keep it to single family with plus one mm -hmm. okay. rather because then because then there's and that's just my opinion but then there's there's a lot of multi multi-family out there that if we're you know and it comes the trickle down effect is zoning amendments go through the public process and then they end up right in the planner's lap to figure so, out some of that's both and it, it'll add a layer of complexity if we have to say this also applies for all the you know, multifamilies yeah. out there. It's going so I mean, I'm not. I'm, does anyone a strong proponent of adding the multifamilies? Like, how married to that are you? No. Right. So I, let's I, I just, just, we have consensus. I think it on depends just on the goal and how many you want to do. Um, two unit owner occupied two units have significantly more resources to do this. They have more. They have generally more income. They have more equity. They're used to being a landlord, so they may even do one that create becomes a rental unit. Um, I. Single family homeowners is like many, many more hurdles to build. And I think, isn't there a clear delineation between duplexes and multifamily? Like, aren't we talking about different animals? I don't think that we have that in this. It is in our bylaw now. We do? Yeah, duplex. Yeah. Oh, multi. duplex would, yeah. That would yes. be there. It'd be the same then, right? Yeah. Across the board. Yeah. No, you know, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, one of the problems with our zoning in general is the fealty, loyalty to single family housing. I mean, if you if you stop thinking about it, single family housing is high, is held on too high a pedestal, and that's why our zoning is the way it is. But we need to get this passed. So I think right. Jeff's um, I yeah. think Jeff's advice is uh, so. Let's move forward with single, and we have a lot of time to push. One yeah. one final question is on the support because I, I obviously we need to get this passed. Yeah. Where are we getting uh, our ideas of how much support there will be versus not support for this, and like how conservative we have to be? Because I, there, there's an enormous amount of interest in backyard homes, backyard tiny homes. Mm. Um, it's it's been very very clear just with the little bit of uh, outreach I've done and like the response on Facebook. Um, I haven't seen mm. any negativity except for a couple of people who showed up at our hearing, the first hearing on Grove Street, they didn't come to the second one. Um, what's going on in Northampton, getting rid of, rid of single family zoning altogether. Uh, Amherst is interested in doing this. I, I, I don't think there's gonna be a lot of pushback, no. but I'm also new to town, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet my life on that either. The pushback only comes at, when it's in somebody the, else's back. Right, the pushback's right. gonna it's, come it's, from the people. It's, it's, it's in your neighborhood. Exactly, and if we can, so we had, we had a situation in, uh, I want to say it was the late 90s, maybe it was the early aughts, where in my neighborhood, which is uh, Precinct 3, they, they changed the zoning to 50-foot frontages mm -hmm. and a couple of houses to make it to do infill, and a couple of houses started going up and the people went nuts. Was that shorter or bigger? Shorter. Yeah, I, I don't know, what was it, 100? Yeah, but they, they uh, changed the zoning, I think, is R10 to R5, which means basically you know, right. higher density 
and in that specific example, a house was torn down and three lots were created. The, but there was another example right behind mine on Lux. Right. Was, right. Well, yeah, and it was the same same type of thing. Yeah. And it, partly it was a different era, but it was the old, you know, the tenements are coming, even though even though they weren't multifamily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That right. was the, you know, uh, I think I think we ha I think Chris is, you know, in, to his point, I think we have moved on um, from that. I think guys like Tom and I were just still the battle worry of some of the battles. I, I like even in 1996 when the zoning was changed. Um, we had built our building on Main Street in 1988, and in 1996 zoning there was some re there was some retribution. They said that no multifamily could be more than six units. It's because we built a 24 unit. There was that thinking in town. No one will come out and say it. No one says they're a bigot. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Know. Sure. And so, I'm not, and so, oh. so your point. Sorry. So your point about Chris and Chris, maybe who who who's going to object and who's going to come out? That that's a sixty-four thousand dollars question. Anybody who's looking to do one of these is probably going to come out and support. Anyone who's got a neighbor with an extra lot is maybe going to come out opposed to it because they don't so, want that. Sure. So. so so it seems to me that um, Jeff has suggested a particular route so that we can get this ball rolling and I'm not sure why we have to be worried about adding more units at this time where that's something that we can strive for. Well it's what the goals towards. are. How many like by passing this what does the town hope to see? So that's that's um, and I don't know the answer. Well I'm not generally an incre incrementalist and I usually hate incrementalism. <laughs> well, but, but I think the only realistic approach to this right now is to do it in this small way and to keep adding to it because right. when inevitably there's an outcry, we could pull one small thing back instead of scrapping the whole yeah, thing. Right. right. And I, I and think one way to do it for this for because I, I know you know we're, we've been talking about it for a while, but I think it's a key discussion, just so you know, I think this is an important discussion. We're the the goal is to remove barriers. I mean, that's what right. that's what's set out in the in in our request for proposals. That's what the consultant is going to be helping us do. And I think um, to get one additional unit, so single family plus one, with a building permit, is would be a huge accomplishment. And it's about ninety five percent of the stock in the city yep. too. But I think I think the way to do it is again. So we're trying to get this by right, the single family plus one by right. If if nothing else, the conversation could be that. Um, going from two, like two plus one, could at least just keep it as a special permit. So we don't want to close the door, and but, but those people are gonna people are gonna want to know that there's still a process for some type of these developments, and and I think that is fine. Like as long as it's still an option for someone, it's a little bit more rigorous. Yeah, where you'd have to go five special permit. But then this this plus like the single family plus one by right, we want kind of. We want kind of a straight shot right. to, to get it yeah. um, accomplished. And I think adding duplexes plus one is going to make it more complicated. The rockier road. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, you were asking who's going to support it. And I think that anyone who's been following all the city council, I can't imagine any city councilors are not going to support it. Um, especially anyone who's been following our housing problems is going to support it. The people that are going to say no are, are only going to say no when it affects them directly. Well, also remember, there's different types of single family. Yeah. You know, single family in the broadest sense of the downtown area are probably going to be generally supportive of it. Single family in um, some of the subdivisions that have larger lots mm -hmm. are going to look at it a little differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, but in, fa in fairness, to just quickly, one thing that Jeff said, about 10 years ago, Northampton started to um, re-look at their zoning, and they went through an accessory apartment mini battle. Ever since then, though, their loosening up of zoning has been almost like seamless, smooth, non-issue. It was just a, the first time it went through, you know, there was, but then after a while, it was like no big deal. And I think that would happen here as well. You get this done, and then later on, when you go on for the second one, people are going to be like, "Whatever, that looks okay." Mm -hmm. You know, I, mean, I just think 
Yeah, it's hard to be patient, but I think we have yeah. to be. Chris, you're, you're start, get it started. Most exactly. of role is yeah. your push. Your early research, I thought I heard you say that you identified like 100 lots in East Hampton where one of these could go. Um, how, many, how many of those were multifamily? I didn't, they weren't because I, they're not allowed. Yeah, so so you've got 100 that could go in East Hampton by right if this and that's, passed well, on so the one family properties. I do, the one thing I want to say, besides how many people will support this, I, I want to be, just point out, I don't know that by right is the right thing to focus on to get more of these done. So Northampton allows these by right in a couple of districts. Uh, Shootsbury allows these by right. Great Barrington allows these by right. There's tons of examples, but it hasn't moved the needle on ADU creation. I think more there are more important things in that bylaw that prevent people from doing this than by right versus special permit. And don't get me wrong, I hate the special permit process, but if you have an opportunity to do this, three months of, of a little bit of torture is much better than, say, putting this in the middle of your backyard because the setback requirement's wrong. So I, it's that's the one piece. I, I don't I don't think that that's the right thing to focus on. Is the first thing to get through if we want to spur some development. My, my well, so you think setbacks are the other issue? I think setbacks are more important than by right, and I've already turned homeowners down because of the setback requirement, <laughs> not because of the the CBA process. The one thing, and I think we've already sort of agreed that the multifamily is not going to be on the table, but you were saying that because there's more equity involved, that there's more money to allow these things to happen. But on the other hand, then they're looking at um, you know, developers looking to make money, trying to well, rent the where, as opposed to the single family, it's solving a financial situation either with the family yeah. or right. it's, it's creating more housing for the people that live in the community, as opposed to developers trying to connect another rent out of that piece of property. Most right. of the and two unit rules require owner occupancy, so it's not a so it's not a gotcha. investor owned, and the, more so than the money, it's the experience of being a landlord, a two unit. Already know, they already know what it's like to be a landlord. They're not worried about adding one more. So, so I just, because I we get to setbacks at some point, so Chris and I have had a couple of conversations. I mean, this, I don't think this just doesn't cover setbacks for, for what it's worth. Okay, because I think it should, and I think what, what I, it's all about um, making the goal, making this achievable. So my, my initial concerns with setbacks has been um, to change them across the board you know, just causes everyone to, to, we have to look everywhere. We just have to kind of like, that's what you do when you make a zoning change that applies across a district without any other considerations. You really have to be prepared to kind of uh, do an analysis and, and have people understand uh, before you, we don't want to be surprising people. I think that that's where we could go wrong is. Or ourselves. Us, or, or ourselves. But so, what we had talked about, same idea with the uh, multi-family plus one by special permit. You know the idea that's that's approachable in my what's achievable in my opinion, and that's the basis for the grant is to get data to support all this. So so we are moving slightly ahead, but I'm I'm comfortable with this, knowing that we have a consultant on board who's going to provide us with data that's going to say one of the best things we can do is add more units, and then they're going to articulate the types of units that would be desirable. And we expect the ADUs to fill some of the gap, and then we expect like some adjustment to the zoning for the large property on Main Street to fill another gap. So we're not going to just focus on one thing, but it's multiple things. Setbacks, so so I think what Chris has encountered as an issue is right now, if you can't meet the setbacks, you can't even apply for a special permit to ask for a variation from that. And I think that's where kind of, the special I permit, in my opinion, would be useful to say you meet single family setbacks today you can get a building permit. If for some reason you need variation on a side yard setback or a rear yard setback, then you can apply for the special permit and, and that would allow you at least to go to the process, which right now I you thought can't. that you the setback issue was addressed by the, um, the piece about that the entrance should be less visible from the street view. So in my mind, that meant it was... I think setback from the property line is, is what we mean. Like you have to be... Uh, okay, sorry. Eight. What is it? Some feet from the property line. 25. I was thinking curb. I think it's 25 huge. is the killer one, especially if you look at like... It's all of our town. You basically can't build it. Right. So uh, a couple of things stepping back. Um, <laughs> what Casey was saying is, is really what my goal is, is that I want elderly people who have nowhere to go. Like we've identified that as a problem. I'm sure the housing study is going to show that. They've got these 2,000 square foot, 2,500 square foot homes. 
that they've owned for 30 years, they, they have nowhere to go because they can't sell it and buy a starter home, you know, a smaller thousand square foot home for $300,000, $250,000. So it'd be great if they could just partition part of their home off, throw a front door, a side door on, now they have rental income and they can age in place. That's my goal. I love what you do and I want that to be wrapped in to this too. Um, I think setbacks are kind of out of scope for this committee, right? I mean, we 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 can't. Uh, unless well, I think I would, I would leave it along. I would leave it along the lines that Jeff just, just suggested that we have present setbacks. If 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 if, if the um, request meets that, for one, it's by right. Yeah. yeah. So just say a setback is ten feet from the side yard, and one house needs to be because of the the, the lot. Eight feet. Well, then that's going to go before this this, uh, this yeah, special yeah. permit. Crafting it's very easy because it would go along with this. You would put like an asterisk, you know, in R10. It may not. I don't know if we'll get to every zoning district in town, but in the R10, I think it's pretty easy to identify you have pretty small lots. And if you have a 25 foot side and a 25 foot rear, you are actually really constrained. So you know the ability to apply for a special permit. You know you could even tie it closely to this and say for for an accessory dwelling unit um, that doesn't meet the setbacks, a special permit may be, um, may be available, may be applied for or whatever. So, so I do think it would So do you time. think what this report, the completion of this, is needed for this to go forward? No. Okay. I think um, the timing is, we want to we want be aware of the timing, but I think as Chris has said, to start the process right. takes probably you know, at a minimum, it's probably going to take three months before it gets to the planning board as a public hearing. And we may have a decision then. We might want to wait a little bit. We may want to purposely wait until there's some data coming out. Just in, in the event that... That's my... That, well, well, I, I agree that that report disagrees what we all yeah, so seem to know, which we're, I don't think is likely. What I was getting at is if, if, if the committee th was in agreement um, I'd be willing to let you two work on the draft for the next meeting's review. Great. And then we give it our blessing, and then you start that process. I already have. I I'm, you I'm have ready. Ready. Yeah. I, I just got to type it. And, and I mean, I think these are the key discussions, though. Like in terms of rather than Chris and I crafting something, I think having some input. So like. See, that's why. I, see. No, 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 that, I know. But I, I think know. I think we got yeah. the flavor though. No, I appreciate yeah, all right, this. I'm right, not yeah. trying to like. It wouldn't be so bad if we could stay on task though. But yeah, but we got the flavor. <laughs> well, no, the, the flavor seems to be keep it simple. This is the first step. Right. So the details, I don't mind you guys and, working and out. And I understand. I understand what you're both saying about the setbacks. I don't think we're trying to get in the weeds on the setback, but but simply give people an avenue to well, go. Well, they have an avenue they, already. No, they yeah. don't. They're dead in the water. There, there's no way to apply it? No, no, I think that's what Chris is saying. No, so the, you're dead in the water. I, well, the so experience I, that I, I just I, had at the CBA, I, it doesn't feel like they're going to grant variances on setbacks but, in most situations. But could they? No, I, no, because variance, you it's know. It's a whole other, like. It has a set criteria, so you're creating, like, so the idea of adding another building and not meeting the setbacks is a self-created hardship. But I don't. So that we want to remove the discussion of a variance and make it a special permit. Well, I don't know that we need that, Let's though. Open that so door. what Let's I've just seen, say you can go for a special permit. If you if you don't meet the setbacks today, you're not you're dead in the water. I, I totally saying, agree with that. But and, and but, we're, we're not going to get into whether the setback should be 15 or 25 or 12. Uh -huh. Just open the door for the possibility to go for a special permit. If so with need, setbacks, yeah, what a lot of towns are doing, they're not they're not like basketing these into accessory structures and dealing that's with that's what i'm about to say so they're like right now we're dealing with setbacks that are expecting a completely different they're not expecting another living unit so what i have seen is an accessory dwelling ends up being a prime part of the primary structure and it fits that setback so if the primary dwelling is 10 feet this is 10 feet and in sometimes they'll add an additional um, barrier in between some kind of hedge or a fence um, but rather than change the accessory structure setbacks all of the thing, I think you just reclass defining what this thing is. What is an accessory dwelling unit, whether it's attached, detached, or within. So uh, bear with me because I'm confused about it. If I want to build a shed, I can't go before the Board of Appeals. If I want to build it right on the line, 
Yeah, feet off. Yeah, four hundred square foot. Just, 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 just depends on how tall it is. Just depends on how tall it is, right? But no, sure. No, there's also yeah, yeah, depends. Give, but I can go before and and let me give you some context. See, before no, no, no. I don't know. Before before like 1996 in in this town and many towns, the ZBA was the prime planning function. Right. Then at some point in time, though, use variances and variances became harder in general. So the ZBA is, is supposed to be the last resort. When you make the planning board more important or more like an asterisk of this wrote a planning board, they have much more, from a state law point of view, much more leeway on looking at things. It, you know, uh, you, I mean, I've seen lots where they were missing two feet of front and shot down because there really was no, other than being a nice guy, a good reason, even though the lot would have been fine, because it could be challenging court, because ZBA's variances, the case law is, is tough. So the ZBA, the zoning board, you want to be used as a last resort. You <coughs> want to do anything, everything you can through the planning board. The only problem with special permit process is it's a super majority. Right. That's the only issue. But that supposedly every year they're looking at that. But right. <laughs> right. Right. So I guess so. You were saying that most they're not basketing it with ADU zoning changes, right? Most communities, because I don't think that's the. I mean, what yeah. what's stopping? So the ZBA is the last resort, and right now planning can't. I mean, the planning board can't actually approve something that's out of existing <laughs> zoning. Am I am I correct in understanding that? If I wanted to no build that, they have no mechanism. Yeah, we're, yeah. They have no mechanism to approve a special dispensation for someone to build something. So, so what we're saying what in this document, Chris, is why is this document? That, though? Let's give them that mechanism because we can kill two birds with one stone. Okay, I mean, I'm not opposed to doing we've, it. In this all document, we're doing is giving them the mechanism. It seems that it would be a one-line ordinance, okay. zoning ordinance, to, that would just change that, right? Like, what's what's stopping us? Correct. Well, I think you're right, but w who's going to come forward with a petition for that with that one line? So what's the drawback in including it in this document? They can, I, they no, can, I, they I, can I still strike it. They can still strike it at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I'm not when we talk about support opposed, that, it just seems like a weird. When, when we talked about about we just get the ball rolling with this and let it roll. Mm -hmm. I, I assume somebody needs to be at these meetings to defend this document because if nobody's there. They're going to come up with questions or issues and say. Well, I think yeah, I think um, yes, I think um, if it wasn't clear, this committee yeah. is going to come to a lot of these meetings and help articulate some of the like, exactly. discussions. And really, there has to be a champion right. of Thank of you. the concept. Um, right. And I, I think what what you had said is there. There's a way to get a city councilor to. Um, Adopt, adopt to, to take this on and put it forward into the process. And yeah, so no, I, I otherwise, I, it's, yeah. so but I know it's really um, nuts and bolts kind of thing. But if um, I had a question for Chris while he's here, so if under your experience so far with your with your um, special permit application, if you had the road, and then were you subject to this? What do you recall off the top of your head? What the side yard and rear yard setbacks? Twenty five. And there wasn't a rear yard. There was there wasn't a rear yard because right. you kind of um, what I would say is you um, really kind of carefully positioned it as an accessory structure. Right. But on the side yard, there was a requirement that would have dictated something related to its height. Um, so you um, couldn't. You we can't go. There's a height cap. I mean, if we had if we had tried, and we're actually going to hopefully do this in the next couple months with a homeowner on your street. Um, if we go less than 12 feet, now we can be six feet from the prop from the side yard. But that doesn't make sense either, because now I'm incentivized to go design something just to get it closer to the edge. But the, like the height, 12 feet versus 20 feet, doesn't doesn't make. Yeah. Um, so can I, guess I, I would like to jump in for a moment. It. There are two other things I would like to achieve in the next 20 minutes. So let's wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> I believe there's a little bit of technical discussion around an approach on setbacks based on what I'm hearing from Chris I mean I think the fitting it in where it's kind of fitting in jammed in a little bit we could probably try to fix that a little bit uh, well I, I would go back to that I would suggest that 
Chris, Chris, and you work on that because You're gonna I think something like that should not be by committee. Okay. Although uh, we've already done a lot of work on it. No, no, but I'm saying when can you just say the specific things that are changing without us going into a lot of discussion about them? No. Well, before I do that, I just want to, because I'm going to, I just want to know what language can I add as a one or two line thing that gives the planning board the power to overrule zoning? I'll send you something. I mean, okay. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. There are not so much in East Hampton's ordinance, but in other towns, it's loosely called like a release valve where, where okay. something doesn't fit. You, you can vary it by a special permit, and that's we're lacking that in a couple sections of the ordinance, it's not just this discussion. So um, it's it's pretty straightforward. I can, we can, we can work come up with that language. I think to Josh's point, I mean, I think in my humble opinion, the, the things we just covered were the big kind of policy yeah. questions. The rest is going to be kind of like... And to answer your order. question, I, I changed, you know, town to city. I, we quite, I talk about inspector versus the building inspector versus commissioner you know really this this document doesn't do much except say you don't have to go to the planning board to get your per you just do it by a building permit okay that that was really what i wanted from the beginning um with that awful incrementalism um and, oh this there's also this is actually something we should talk about this document strike um uh, removes airbnb from the equation in other words, you can't build an ADU to use it as an Airbnb. I, I think that we do need more Airbnbs, yeah. so I struck that from the document, uh, but it's worth talking about. I agree with well, you. I think that sounds like a wonderful thing to talk about in February. Yep. Are you comfortable with that? Um, is there anyone opposed to it? Well, it I'm asking about, you because I am thinking of you as the facilitator of this endeavor. Well, the way I'm looking at it now is I'm going to type it up, give it to Jeff, we're going to bounce back and oh. forth, and then we're going to The only thing about A or B you have to keep back your mind is who is going to enforce it. That's another thing that right. I mean, here is also. So if you strike order. it, you don't have to worry about it. Right, uh, yes, and I also struck owner occupied. Yes, I think, I think that's that. where you really get it is yeah. that in this model, that as envisioned, um, how about this? One of the owners have to live in one of the units. Who's going to enforce it, though? I mean, that, that's why I struck it, because it's well, great to say it, but. Well, there are, there is a way to enforce it, but so I'm not, and Chris, you probably have done more research than I at this point, but a lot of towns, the comfort level of people in the community comes from that an owner lives in one of the two units. So so if we really want to try to take an incremental approach, which I understand most people may not want to do that, but a lot of the language is one of one of the units shall be owner occupied. And that what that does is I in my opinion I think that frees up that second unit to be whatever whatever it might be. It might be for a parent for a little while and if that parent you know passes away or something then they could jump in and they could Airbnb it or they could rent it, or they could, you know, do, they could like condoize it and sell it to somebody. And, Great. And okay. I think at the end of the day, Chris, <laughs> no, no one enforces it. I think what happens is a neighbor drops a dime when they right. see something yeah, going on. Yeah, what he's saying, going the on. comfort level. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen, I mean, are there any communities just doing like, so it just becomes then it's two units of potential rental. I don't see any reason to get rid of that to eliminate owner occupancy. There's okay. like potential more. finance benefits, but. Like Jeff is saying, it helps get this through. And if yeah, we yeah. keep that and get some yeah, I'm, I'm not married to it. So, um, so here's my recommendation. Yeah. I think that in the intervening three weeks between now and the next time we meet, the two or however many of y'all want to bat this back and forth mm -hmm. and come up with what you think is the strongest recommendation, identify the things that you think might need somebody else to weigh in on okay. and maybe there's one or two things we're going to send it out with the agenda so everyone has time to read it before the february 18th meeting you pose in that message that we share with them here are the two things that maybe we need to still talk about that we're open to changing language on and then we make that decision then because yeah. interestingly it Next meeting, we will also have Jana and Jackie here from the Fair Perfect. Housing Partnership, and I think it would be worthwhile for them to know. Right, what and the then story so, is. but we'll get a vote next month yes. on this because yes. I don't want to deal yeah. with this anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. We'll smooth yeah. it along. Okay. Chris, I'll meet you uh, What's that? Tonight. I'll meet with you and we'll go over okay. to uh, kick around that. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I blindsided Cassie and Josh when I said they would give us a little update on vacant storefronts. Um, 
So what I have requested instead is a little mini update on where we think we're headed. So here is, and I'm, boy, I'm getting the willies about what this process is going to look like, but here's <laughs> Arlington. <laughs> And to be clear, I think that this is a marvelous way to get people thinking in the same room about things that I think we all volunteered to be on this committee for. Sorry. Um, and I, I propose that we don't even get into it tonight. Yep. I just, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And I just wanted to point out a couple things. They do have guidelines mm -hmm. for what they consider appropriate art only in Arlington. And um, they have a wall of shame on their website listing people that own vacant webs uh, vacant property mm. and what the rent is and that kind of thing. And the thing they do that I really like is putting the person's name and phone number on the building <laughs> in, case <laughs> <that there's, laughs> in case there's an event, you know, that you need to be in touch with them. So with that said, we'll, we can address it in more detail at another meeting. Great. Thank you. Cassie, I just wanted one thing that I brought up at the last meeting. Does this try to distinguish between that um, owner of a storefront that is um, clearly actively trying yes. to rent it versus yes. something like Hurry and Scurry? Yeah. Okay. Very much so. Good. We'll read it through. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate you, Cassie. Yeah. Okay. In the next 13 minutes. Um, we have talked at various intervals about things that we're interested in doing. I would like to know um, if anything has changed, if we've added anything to the list, so that at our December meeting this year, we can look back on 2020 and say, oh, we did these cool things. What are some things we'd like to achieve this year, friends? Oh. <laughs> oh, Josh and Cassie have, I think they're it's making the same thing. eye contact. Um, Burn in the company's toners today. Sheesh. <laughs> um, you know, this is on television. Yeah, this is really They know cool. now. <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah. Well, something we should definitely oh, do. It's wicked sexy. Ooh, we yeah. could put in the town demographics. You didn't get it yet. Um, <laughs> you want one? The people in the departments, a letter from Mo. We could do very cool yeah. things. What do we call this? Corresponding links. We kind of, Ooh. as I, as I'm not mistaken, I think a couple of years you, ago, you we us. started tossing around the idea of doing this. Uh -huh. Although, at the time, I think it may have been more closely geared to potential business owners. Uh huh. But this includes potential business owner stuff, but it also is just really cool for anyone who might think about living in this campus. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you had had one of these a year ago, I'd be here sooner. Yeah. But I think that's, that's, a really, that that's a really good point. I know people who specifically moved to East Hampton because of the master plan. Like no doubt really? that was the, that was the defining thing because they said oh, this this city's got their you know too but this city has their ducks in a row and they saw where and well, they, they were right the philosophy of the big box stores and that right you know yeah. idea of, of what yeah, so where did where did this reside was it on the city's website the, the town of Arlington's website or yeah on our website what did, what did, what do we call this? Is this a welcome packet, an orientation thing? What is this? What do we call this? Is this prospectus? Yeah. Oh. Mm. Or me? Not yeah. Business, business and, but and citizenship, resident, resident prospectus. Okay. Well, I guess, I, I guess that's one thing you might want to think about. What's your audience? Business. Elements of citizen right. first. Yep. Yep. Probably all three. Yep. But you can address yes. all three, but right. That's but what I'm saying. But you need to have that in a heading of some yeah. sort. Not yeah. just business owners. Because that's yeah. permitting. Yeah, but this is, um, this, I think this is trendless. This is trendless, but I, I, only thing I would suggest if the future discussion is somehow to involve ECA with this without it becoming, um, bogged down. <laughs> they, you know, they, they have their own thing going on. Okay. Some, some way of, you know, just an overlap. A that, liaison. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, the ECA though, that's no, specifically that's the arts is running. Right. I think arts could be part of this. Right. But I think it's a higher level aspect for the Android. Yeah. I have no idea. Another thing is, do we want to target a single audience to keep it more manageable the first year? Yep. 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 That dreaded yeah, yeah. incrementalism again. Cool. Or I think that's we want to make it broad, residents and businesses. Interesting. Well, look at this page where 
that they have how Arlington stacks up the rental rates compared to towns around them. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, he, would we I, do well there? I, 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 I think we would do. I think, no, I think we would do incredibly well. Mickey D says we would do he gets well. more. I mean, someone said to me, "That's it with North taxes. Hampton. I'm moving out of East Hampton. I'm going to West Hampton." Hmm. I said, "Let me know how that works for you." Yes, because, enjoy. Yeah, it won't work. Um, but I, I think that puts some stuff in perspective when it comes to, uh, you know, they, it's interesting. I got into rental. I think we would compare very favorable. Right. So I, I, I think the around. target, though, has to be citizens as well as uh, businesses because there are a lot of businesses that are not traditional Main Street. Okay. Right. They want to be part of the scene one way or another. So I'm going to stop you there and say, wonderful. I want less discussion about this. It's a great possible topic. We'll talk about it later. Yeah. It's, um, a, great, it's a great 2020. Love project. it. Way to be on the ball about that. Um, other things that we've talked about in the recent past. Somehow, as this committee representing uh, all businesses across East Hampton, East Hampton, sharing good news, openings, et cetera, um, we had a, uh, a little bit of a conversation with your sister about the possibility of her helping us with that. We haven't gotten into any real details about that. If that is worth um, paying attention to in the future, we should. And if nobody's interested in following up on that, we're going to let that fall to the wayside. Chamber does that already, don't they? Chamber does it for chamber for members. Chamber members. Say that yeah. again? Like you do with the ribbon cutting and all oh, that that's celebration. Oh, we're going to do bigger. Oh, and I but, do ribbon but, cuttings for no, but, but non members. I mean, members and non members. Right. But Whoever that, comes to town and I know about them. Gotcha. I don't always know about them. Right. People don't like to share the but information. That, they don't want to share Right. So we would right. think of our. I think one of the original suggestions awesome. was to be a kind of hub for, we know the things that are happening. That would be really cool. We're, and be we're really keeping our fingers on lots of pies and we're sharing that out. You know, rising tides and welcoming businesses, welcoming business. They don't have to be a member. Yep. Yeah, I mean, right. maybe just boost That's my perspective. EDIC social media presence with what we're doing, what other committees are doing. Right. Hmm. Okay, Is so that that's something we at? can talk about. Yes. yes. Okay. Great. So we're going to talk about that. As, like, what I want to get at mainly is how do we operationalize this very good idea, recognizing that we have a staff person who sometimes spends time with us, and his job is not to be responsive to us. Um, third idea. Uh, we talked about this particularly in relation to the Union Street ideas, but just in general, the idea of use of parking lots, creating relationships with local business owners that have parking lots. Like, how do we how do we operationalize that? It's not a big topic. It's specific to some places and not very many. So that's something that we could talk about, or we can say, mm, someone else figure it out. I think we should nail down fixing that parking issue and getting private partner, pri private public relationships going, or at least figure it out, okay. get the ball rolling. I think okay. that that's right on our mandate. <laughs> And I think um, one of the ways to help this happen is we're, is to be a little bit patient. So I think if we can start working on updating the economic development part of the master plan, mm -hmm. so there will be there should be some exercise <coughs> about these goals. And so I think like the goals of EDIC. So I think it's good to continue to articulate your goals. Yep. Then my my job, and I, I do like coming to this committee. I do like trying to help. Is to get the goals listed somewhere, and then we work towards accomplishing them. And so I think to your point on parking, I think the downtown strategic plan should be, should be the launching point for you as the EDIC to do a couple things. There's quite a bit listed in there that I think yep. EDIC will be involved with. And, and then the housing plan will have some goals that EDIC will help to Jeff, you refer to economic development master plan. Yes. Chapter. There's a the chapter, chapter of the in the yes. plan. So our goal should be to review up, that, review okay. that, and update that sure. for 2020. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do. yes. I just think that moderation, I think, is going to win the day there. So, <laughs> but I would. So, <laughs> when I could I, share oh, out the chapter with all of you again. You could read it, I and you could pull out. I could task each of you with saying, "Here's something that I really care about. Here are two things I really care about." I also, I think, I hear. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. Is you're saying, uh, don't be overzealous because there's some stuff coming along. Well, that, and I, I mean, the goal that the goal that I have set out is to help as as a staff person in the planning department. But also, I think what I need is like this internship idea. It what, what we charted out was at like a year. It was a year with the intern because there's a lot of data. There's a lot of stuff that no one, not like stuff like stuff that needs to get done. 
and finding like an intern as the person to grind through that is going to be kind of a, like a gem. So just what my 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 problem was the intern was only available through May. So then the idea would be to bring in another intern who can pick up where they left off mm -hmm. and grind through the middle part of updating the chapter and then there would be a third intern who would like okay. be formatting and it would be a document of right. goals and I so I just think it's just a it's just to stretch the goal a little bit longer and Okay. I think it's, sorry, that's no, it's fine. I think that it is relevant. Like, I'm happy to share it with all of you. And if you want to read it, it's compelling reading. It was well written. Um, and we can look at the things and feel very proud. Those of you who have been part of this for longer than I have can certainly look at it and go, well, dang, we've achieved quite a bit. Um, and also, the the layout of the land, the lay of land has changed a little bit, so what, what yeah, are we interested in now? So, I mean, some of that is coming out of the downtown strategic plan, so we're gonna wait to finalize that. We'll probably get something out of reading the draft when we get it in the next week or so. Is that what you said? Something's coming in the next week or so. It doesn't matter, that's not the point. It, it um, two weeks. <laughs> so, I don't mean that we have to decide right now. All the list of things that we're going to achieve and lay out a specific action plan for that, I just want to have things in our minds that we know that we want to be making forward progress on regularly, and these are some good ideas. Okay, it's 527. Barring anybody else saying that they want to talk about something, I think we should leave. Motion to adjourn. No, sorry. Too late. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it. It Send, sending the master plan or the portion thereof. Yeah. It's hard to read it just by itself. Um, so I, if I, if you may, if, if I may, you may, had a conversation with the intern this morning, and I asked her to kind of go over the master plan because if you say economic development, what I think is a little bit lacking is that it's not just one thing. So what we've been really successful at is, especially if you take arts and culture, yep. arts and culture has its own chapter, but it has driven a lot of economic development. So I think we can do a better job of connecting all the things happening to economic development. And right. So it's not just one. I it's think not just one thing. When sending that out, because it's not just one. Well, thing. but I think I think you, well, you need to I'm see it because send it all I'm, out. And if you guys want some reading, the goal should, should be to update it. And my 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 thing was about the welcome. We're open for businesses that. Um, we just need to be cognizant that there is a small business permitting guide already. It could be potentially better or improved, but right. it's for businesses who want to come to East Hampton. We, we there was an effort in 2016 to kind of help, and, and then this is more like too wordy and too bogged down. Yeah, this is a little bit. This one's a little bit more like branding or advertising. Yes, yeah, right. which I think is important. Right, right. right. But we I do have a nuts it. and more nuts and bolts for businesses. Right. So I just don't want someone to think we don't have that already. We do. Right. right. Okay. I still think that something like this is needed. Okay. We can be make, we have a better message as far as we really could. Cool. All right. Who would like to move to get us out of here? I did I already. Do. Oh my gosh. Did. <laughs> you did. That's so great. All right. Are we all in favor of getting out of here? Aye. 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 Goodbye. Aye.